Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from in Canada. My name is Akila Peoples. I'm CEO of Mental Health Research Canada, and I'm leading the conversation today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And I know uh, all of you are joining from many different traditional territories and uh, we're delighted to have uh, such a broad audience across Canada and a special welcome uh, to our uh, three guests who have enthusiastically volunteered their time today uh, to speak about this important topic. Uh, this session is named It Starts at the Top and that's very deliberate uh, because in uh, these challenging times especially, uh, we believe workplace wellness needs to be front and center with CEOs, not just residing in HR that it may have been years ago, uh, but now it is that important that leaders need to lead with this uh, in very clear focus. A couple of items before we get started. Uh, all of the audience, uh, other than the panelists, are muted, uh, but there is a chat box and do feel free to enter some questions. I guarantee you I have more questions that uh, I'm going to have time to ask, but uh, uh, we'll try to monitor the chat as well. Uh, also a reminder that the session is going to be recorded and we're very pleased it will be available on our website in the next few business days. And we encourage you to share it with any colleagues or anyone else that you think uh, may be interested that couldn't join today. Immediately following the panel, which will last about 45 minutes, we're very pleased that Mary Ann Baton uh, from um, Workplace Strategies for Mental Health is going to be unpacking some of the conversation that you hear today, as well as providing uh, some information about readily available evidence-based resources uh, that any employer can use uh, to advance their mental health in the workplace programs. Uh, so thanks to Marianne, and we'll be introducing her uh, down the road. Our goal for this session is to shine a spotlight on how important this issue is and to shine a spotlight also on leaders uh, that know how important this is so that you as an audience can hear directly from them. Um, it's also to help uh, encourage the use of existing resources uh, because not all employers um, have workplace mental health programs, or certainly many employers would like to advance or augment their workplace mental health programs. Now, your input as an audience is very important to us to help us plan future sessions. And our next session is on Bell Let's Talk, to, uh, Bell Let's Talk Day in partnership with Bell Canada. It will be run in both official languages. Uh, and your feedback on what we do with future sessions like this is really important so that we make sure we're providing useful information. And I'm gonna start that right now by asking you as an audience to fill out one poll that should be popping up on your screen uh, right now. It's one question that asks you very simply for future events, what content will be helpful. You can select as many items as possible from that list of suggested five. Uh, and that information is gonna be very useful for us as we move forward. You can also email us anytime at events at mhrc.ca with any suggestions or thoughts that you might have. I'll give you just a moment or two to do that and then I'll prepare to introduce our speakers. So I'd like to move right along because I know we're gonna quickly run out of time. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be introducing uh, Anthony Longo, who's president and CEO of Longo Brothers Fruit Markets, Inc. Uh, that was established in 1956. Uh, Anthony has been in the CEO role since 1998. Longo's I believe has 38 locations. If you're from Southern Ontario, you'll be very familiar with Longo's as well as uh, their online grocery business, Grocery Gateway. Uh, Anthony is a, a very active community leader and a keen volunteer on many boards in his sector, such as the Food Marketing Institute, the Grocery Foundation, and uh, also uh, on Humber College Board of Governors, where he recently served as chair. And I know mental health has been high on Longo's radar well before the pandemic. It's not something new uh, for them, which is one of the reasons we invited Anthony today. Also, we have Curtis Stang, who's president and CEO at ATB Financial, which is the largest Alberta-based financial institution. Uh, Curtis works alongside 5,000 team members across 208 locations. Uh, he also volunteers on boards and is a member of the Alberta government's uh, Mental Health Advisory Council. 
And notably in 2021, earlier this year, ABT Financial was awarded one of Canada's great places to work for mental wellness, which is very notable for today's uh, session. So clearly a lot of great things happening uh, at ATB Financial to be uh, awarded uh, and acknowledged in that way. I'd also like to introduce Sabine Herji. Sabine is a strategic advisor to business, government, and universities on leadership, talent, culture, equity, diversity, inclusion, well being, purpose, lifelong learning, and upskilling. Uh, as an executive advisor on the future of work at Deloitte, she advises on human capital issues key to transformation agendas. Uh, she's an award-winning leader. Uh, she's had many awards, including the WXN Top 100, and also notably the Canadian HR Awards Ivy Business School Lifetime Achievement Award in Human Resources, uh, very relative uh, to today's uh, topic. So um, a virtual round of applause for um, all of you um, in terms of participating today. And I'd like to start out by giving each of you uh, just a couple of minutes uh, to speak a little bit about why you enthusiastically accepted our invitation uh, to join today. And uh, maybe we'll start with Anthony. Sure. Thanks, Akila. I appreciate the invitation uh, to come out. And, and you know, mental health and, and you know, overall health is, uh, is just such an important part of what we do uh, every day in, through society. So, so I was really happy to, to accept the invitation to join you. Um, I, I think for me, it, um, you know, I think businesses all start with culture. And, um, and at Longo's, you know, our, our culture is summed up as treating you like family is, is the way we sum it up. Um, and again, that's not to say that, you know, we're a soft culture without holding people accountable, et cetera. Um, we see it as being supportive, authentic, and yet firm and fair. And those are instilled in our, in our values of honesty, trustworthiness, and, and mutual respect. So in terms of, you know, how they, you know, they really clearly, in our view, and is connect to mental health and well-being. Uh, but between all of those values, and it's really about caring, uh, caring for our team, and you know the importance of mental health is uh, is a key part of our overall health and wellness pillar. So we don't see them as you know a mental health pillar and a health pillar. It's they're together, uh, physical health and psychological safety. Um, so when we you know when we, we step back and think about you know what's our company purpose, um, our company purpose is uh, fueling happier and healthier lives and. And that purpose doesn't just relate to our guests who visit our stores and or visit us online. It really relates uh, also to our incredible, you know, over six thousand uh, team members. So ensuring that you know that we're, they're going to have healthy, uh, healthy, happy lives is part of that. And of course, mental health and physical health are, are really important uh, in order to have those happy, healthy lives. Um, and then just lastly, I'll just say, um, you know, it really goes. I think without saying that, um, you know, having a team who feels, you know, valued, cared for, uh, and secure and safe, you know, you'll end up having a team that looks after each other and looks after your guests uh, every single day. And that's what's going to create a long-term sustainable business. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Anthony. Curtis. Thanks, Akila, And thanks, Anthony, for those we words. We, we agree 100%. And thanks, Akila, And the work that you do at uh, MHRC, Akila, and the team, uh, has a profound effect on Canadians. So thanks for all that you do. Thanks for your giving this very important topic a voice like you do in such a professional and effective way, especially in the fourth wave of COVID and all the things that are coming up before the holiday season. This is a really important topic. So a bit about ATB, as you mentioned, we're a full service financial institution. Um, we have investment banking, we have wealth management, we have uh, obviously our strong retail branch network offices in Denver, Colorado, in Toronto, and obviously all throughout uh, the province of Alberta. Uh, about 5,000 team members, as you said, and we've been for a number of years now in the top five best places to work in Canada. Um, and so, and a really cool culture, like Anthony said, that's, you know, that's really what we, what we aspire to be. Um, so on the surface, you would think that, you know, we may not be as impacted by mental illness as an organization, but if you thought that you would be wrong, uh, out of the 5,000 team members, anywhere from 75 to 100 every day miss work uh, due to some type of mental illness or supporting someone uh, that's impacted by mental uh, illness. Impact to the bottom line for us as an organization, it's a bit of a, you don't, you don't see it on your income statement, but it's between 16 and $20 million for us. And whether that's in lost productivity or it's in the cost of benefits to support uh, different mental health programs. So it, it, it's important. 
and we all know the stats, Canadian economy, $50 billion annual, six and a half billion of that is due to directly due to lost productivity in the workforce. But I think beyond the economics for us as an organization, and certainly for me personally as a leader, is that mental illness impacts the people that we love. Like it impacts our friends, our family, our colleagues. And so beyond the economics, but I think some CEOs look at the economics of this, we do, but more importantly, beyond the economics, it's just simply the right thing to do. Like when you, when you have people and you care so deeply about people, not only the communities that you serve, but your team, your 5,000 team members, this, this focus on wellness overall and mental health and mental wellness specifically is just super important for us. So just as a highlight, and I know we'll get into some of this on the questions, but as a highlight, we focused really on four things, Akila. We focused on reducing the stigma early on, and that has to start from the top. So I love your topic and your, your, your sort of the objective of today. Um, and then um, we focused in on leadership development because we needed to make sure that our leaders were had the skills to not only identify, but have conversations with and connect people and team members to experts when they needed it. Third, we needed the right tools and the right access to mental health support. And we found that our EFAP was, was lacking in a big way early on. Um, and then fourthly, which we're maturing, and you and I've had a couple of conversations like this about in terms of how we measure. And I think, you know, we're getting better as an organization, but there are some organizations that we're still learning from. So we had a ton of support from our team members on this. And, and so much so when we introduced this a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago now when I became CEO, that we actually had encouragement to expand our mental health support initiatives across the province to, to outside of the 5,000 team members. And in fact, it became a pillar of our greater good strategy, which has three pillars. It's access to education, access to communication, information and technology, and then access to mental health support. Because ultimately, we believe increasing and improving the mental health access and the mental health of Albertans broadly will increase the well-being of the community that we serve, which is incredibly important uh, for us. So we looked at a whole bunch of things. We looked at how we support short-term, long-term leaves. More importantly, how we support return to work accommodation, access to support, again, through our digital EFAP of Inkblot, little shout out for Inkblot, includes a team member network focused on supporting action around mental health and mental health action team. Uh, we partnered with CMHA, the eight different chapters that we have in Alberta, uh, where we actually will refer some of our clients that we feel uh, might be suffering, small business owners specifically, that might be suffering through the pandemic and economic shock. So this is, you know, just expanding the breadth that we have uh, for supporting, um, supporting Albertans. And I think, you know, pre-COVID, I would say that we were confident we were walking the talk uh, when COVID hit a whole nother level, right? I mean, this, this became really tricky and complex for leaders, difficult to anticipate, and how do we create this environment? And I'm keen on digging in on this on the, on the panel question. But some of the things we did, we, we, we introduced Fridays and 30, uh, where 30 minutes I connect with the whole company. And, uh, you know, out of the 5,000, there's generally slightly over 2,000 uh, team members that join. And I just share, and quite often we talk about um, mental wellness and what does that mean for uh, team members. Um, uh, we introduce Wellness Wednesdays. Uh, we, have a, we have a remarkable wellness team at ATB and we have guests each month that I speak to and many times we talk about our mental health quadrant. So overall, you know, I think for mental wellness for ATB, it's not just a nice to have, it's a necessity and it's not just about economics, but it's about the fact that we need a more productive and a happier and healthier uh, workforce. So we're, 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 we're pretty committed to it and a pretty passionate topic for us. Great. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, that was a lot of information and uh, that certainly sets the stage for uh, a lot of follow-up questions. Thank you for that. And over to you, Zabine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Akila, for inviting me on this panel. So let me take a broader perspective um, here. Um, the work that I do, I'm really driven. We've talked a lot about organizational purpose. For me personally, my, my purpose um, is to unlock um, the potential of people to build inclusive prosperity. And um, in this stage of my life where I'm post my full-time, full-on uh, career, uh, where um, I, I spent my entire career at RBC uh, and, and uh, retired a few years ago where I'd been the chief uh, human resources officer for, for 10 years, 
and certainly had done a lot there uh, that had set the stage for this. But, but as I think about this bigger picture for our economy and, and, uh, and our society, the biggest driver of prosperity, of economic prosperity, of social prosperity is our people. And in order to fully unlock the potential of people, of all people, we need to be healthy. Mental health is health, as Anthony uh, uh, very well um, articulated. And, uh, and it affects everyone. It's postal code agnostic. It doesn't matter who you are, what your socioeconomic status is. Mental health is something that touches everyone. Curtis, you touched on that and just the human side of that. Uh, the, there's a lot of data out there on the economic, uh, on the, uh, on the economic impacts. And so bringing it then to the, the current situation, the last two years, almost two years of the, that we've been in this pandemic, um, we have seen the light shone on this really important issue. It was there before, but like a, like a number of other issues, social justice, for example, it has become very clear that if we don't take significant action, if we as organizations, as societies, as individuals, as leaders, don't accelerate the actions that are already in place or don't start to do things, we will not have sustainable prosperity. It's, 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 pretty, it's a pretty simple case. And so what's great to see is organizations like Longos, like ATB, like Deloitte, where I'm an advisor, really um, accelerating the actions that they're taking. The one piece that has been really, really important, there are a lot of programmatic um, things that, that need to happen that are foundational. It is around culture, both uh, Anthony and Curtis have touched on culture. And what we're seeing is this leadership that is more human, that is more caring. And humanity and, and caring is actually a driver of performance. It's not an either or. Uh, we are our best when we feel supported, when we feel valued. And talent is a long game. It's not just about tomorrow. And, and that's also abundantly clear in the labor market today is how uh, uh, talent is, uh, is. We have skill shortages. We have talent uh, needs. And so taking this long game approach to supporting our people ultimately is, is the win-win. And that's what that's that's why I'm here. I think your question was why why did you enthusiastically agree right. to be here? And uh, that's because it's one of the biggest drivers of the success and prosperity of our organizations and ultimately our country. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of you for uh, those comments that help us um, understand your perspectives and, and why you're here. Um, great to see some questions already in the chat. I'll get to some of those in a moment. Um, I'm not going to ask the same question necessarily of all three of you all the time just to change the rhythm and, and whatnot and get some more questions in. But I am going to start on a personal level uh, directed at uh, Curtis and Anthony. Uh, Curtis, you mentioned walking the talk. Uh, I'd like to know how you two as leaders uh, walk the talk when it comes to this issue. Uh, how about we start with Anthony? Sure, I think, um, so for me, especially now during, uh, during COVID, it's about communicating and, um, and just really being vulnerable, sharing, you know, sharing my own anxiety, um, you know, how I'm feeling. And, and I think, you know, what, what I've found over the years is it really helps empower other people to have that conversation. Um, and to know that, you know, their CEO sometimes gets up in the morning and isn't, and isn't feeling, uh, isn't feeling himself today or feel is feeling anxious. And, um, or in the case of, you know, while we're going through COVID being frustrated, uh, scared at some times. And we had, you know, a lot of cases early on, uh, we have zero cases today, knock on wood, uh, in our, in our, uh, business, but it's just really, um, sharing with them, you know, some of the tools that I use, especially in the early days of the, of the pandemic of how I was able to uh, kind of level set myself when I when I did feel that I wasn't uh, quite myself and that there was anxiety there. So I think just opening that up and and um, you know being being vulnerable and, and just sharing you know sharing your examples about how it worked and also just um, I continue to share uh, that we do have great EAP programs uh, in place and how they can help others and 
So for me, um, that was you know, so my personal part of it. And then the business side was really, you know, having those programs and tools, you know, that Curtis talked about earlier as well, having them in place. Uh, and we've had them in place for a long time. It's just, you know, bringing them forward and just talking about them more and more, uh, more and more often. And, uh, and just, you know, a number of other programs that we've, that we've instilled over the years um, here at Longo. So it really, if people see the investment that we've made and, um, so you know, it's a combination of the two, personally telling, talking the story, and secondly, um, having the tools in place and putting your money where your mouth is, not just talking about it, but it's actually, here's the tools you can get uh, to help you and your family. And, and that was the other big thing I would just want to mention is about, uh, I'm trying to remember when, now, two years ago, maybe three years ago, we extended um, all of our EAP to all of our team. So including our, our part-timers, our students, their families. So they could call in if they had an issue uh, an anxiety issue or anything like that and just call in and it was you know, no charge it's all included in our EAP program uh, and, I and I think that really went a long way for people to say well it's not just for you know people that have you know for working full-time and have the benefits or 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 just if you're part-time you get part-time benefits or if you're a student you get nothing no this is the whole team it needs to be healthy and needs to have access to those tools it's it's not exclusionary at all so I thought that was a something that uh, really helped turn the tide for us to have those uh, more open conversations. One quick follow-up before I go to Curtis Anthony, and that was sure. when I had an opportunity to speak with you recently. You told me about your your very simple button program. Yes. Um, yeah, actually, your, I have it here. I'll show you. Have you. Any so of those I, I, handy, by the way, because I know you said that you actually wore those some days, uh, yeah. which I thought was quite extraordinary. Yeah, so these little buttons, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, here it is. So just, this is... Um, this is, it's called Not Myself Today and uh, and just have different, this one says Zen, so that's how I'm feeling today or or happy or anxious or frustrated, like they're just different buttons. And the reason for doing that, it was really effective. And unfortunately, kind of it's one of those things that has fallen off a little bit, not a lot, it's, it's not a little bit, it's fallen off a lot, so we have to bring it back, um, is that it, it opened up the conversation. So if I put this one on, which says overwhelmed, um, it's people say, well, Anthony, how can I help you? You know, was there, is there something that, you know, we should have a conversation about? So it just opens up the conversation and, and it makes it okay to talk about your feelings that, that day. And it's, and again, it's not about being soft. It's about being open, authentic and helping people be their best. You know, I love what Sabine said about, you know, ensuring that helping people be the best they could possibly be. And you can't right. be the best you can possibly be if you've got anxiety or other or other challenges that you're facing. We have to get through that and, and having the conversation really helps alleviate some of that. Thanks. I love those buttons. So that's wonderful. That the CEO will actually put on a button and say, you know, I'm not having my best day today or overwhelmed today. I just think that's such yeah. a a simple but very powerful uh, action. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Curtis, how do you walk the talk as a leader when it comes to this issue? Well, Anthony said it really well. And coincidentally, we have we introduced the buttons of the Not Myself today a couple of years ago as well. And they probably oh, okay. said, well, Anthony, we can connect on how we can get them going back again in the companies. Mm -hmm. But I mean, he said it perfectly. Like, you know, I, I think just to reinforce for me two things as well as how do I as a leader enable the systems and the programs and the tools and the investment that can help team members flourish in the way that we um, all would love them to flourish and they want to flourish. And then secondly, it's about me as an individual. And I, you know, I think through it all, as Anthony said, um, you know, the empathy factor has been really, really high, certainly through the pandemic and through COVID. So I think, you know, I've always been a, what I think is a pretty transparent and accessible leader but there's absolutely a notch of vulnerability that we don't have all the answers, that things were stressful. For us back in April, May, in the financial services industry, our hair was on fire. Like, like, like literally, we were fearful. Uh, and I was in contact with a lot of the big banks. And, and you know, there was, there was some real nervousness about stability of clients, team members, what the pandemic was going to mean, moving workforces to work from home and all the stresses around that. And I think what we... You know, I, I think for me, it was that the accessibility became redefined, especially through the pandemic as well, uh, in that I had family and friends uh, of team members reach out to me and questioning, you know, what were we doing, especially in our branch network. And I, I'm sure Anthony in your stores as well, it's, you know, like I've got my, my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband, my friend is working at a branch. What are you doing to make sure that they're protected? What are you personally doing to make sure they're protected, right? So this was incredibly important. And I think finally, I would just add that on the Fridays and 30, and, and in general, 
uh, one of the questions I get quite frequently is just what are you doing personally? Like, what are you doing personally to stay strong? You know, looking at, you know, okay, what, what is it that you're getting your sleep? Are you eating well? Are you exercising like you should be doing? What are you doing as an individual to keep your mental focus and your cognitive ability sharp? Um, uh, so I think, again, it's both team members want leaders to be present and to make good decisions uh, and at the same time be open, vulnerable, compassionate and, and really, you know, really encourage collaboration across the company. So we, we leaders are that. real people, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zabine, um, can you just comment on how important it is that leaders walk the talk and what kind of trickle down effect uh, there may be? Thanks. So thanks for that question. And I do want to touch on you know, the theme here is it starts at the top. But what also starts at the top is the well-being of senior leaders. And uh, that is um, something that um, hadn't um, perhaps isn't getting enough attention. Uh, we, uh, we, we noted at, uh, at Deloitte that there was a gap in, in terms of data on um, how, what the current state of well-being and resiliency of senior leaders was. We have a lot around broader workforce, around managers, which is absolutely essential, uh, <clears throat> but really felt the need to, uh, to better understand some of what might be the same, what might be different. So we did this uh, research with, uh, with LifeWorks and uh, we had 11 organizations, about 1200 senior leaders uh, participate. And these would be CEO minus one and two levels. And um, what we saw, the, the, the results there were actually quite sobering. The, the state of well-being and resiliency of senior leaders um, is concerning. It, it is uh, something that, as we think about recovery from the pandemic, does really pose business risks to us there. And of course, as you say, leaders are human. And, and, and the, the important uh, point to make there as well is that you mentioned the trickle-down effect, which is leaders actually affect what's happening in their organizations. Because if they're not mentally well, strong, resilient, that's going to permeate the uh, very quickly into the organization. And so putting on your own oxygen mask first, uh, as we often see on, on, uh, on planes, which I know most of us have not been on uh, for, for quite some time, but there's a reason that, uh, that that's, uh, that's what we're asked to do before we can help anyone else. So let me just speak to a couple of things on what can we do and what's different maybe around uh, supporting senior leaders. One of, and, and while it's popping up in the senior leader data, I think it is extendable uh, more broadly. One of the things that came through is the importance of peer relationships and how colleagues can really support one another in, um, in, in, in providing that empathy, providing that support. Because really, in, in particularly for senior people, you don't see your boss that much. Your work is often with your peers. And so how you work together, um, how you're supportive, and also how you're making uh, choices and decisions around, uh, around resources, around managing the, the, the priorities, because uh, certainly what's also happening is workload. Curtis, you mentioned the bank, you know, your hair was on fire. And for leaders, it, it that in, in some ways, while it's, it's tamed a little bit, uh, uh, the, the flames are perhaps, uh, you know, they're, they're not as uh, burning as high. Even as we look at what's happening right now with, you know, with a new variant, with back to, okay, what's going to happen? Um, the, the, the pressures on, on leaders um, really will have, haven't gone away. And um, so I, I encourage organizations to also focus on that group and, um, and, and really to be um, the, the support that, that's provided to employees um, is also very helpful to leaders because in this survey, one of the things we found leaders, when we asked them what's, what's the, the biggest uh, drivers of, of stress, it's actually, it's work volumes followed very closely by, I'm not sure if I'm providing enough support to my employees. And so having that access, having that 
permission, um, setting the tone to really enable them to, to provide those resources is really important. And I see quite a few questions here around um, how uh, with, with employees uh, working from home, and I want to be very clear, and of course, Anthony, you know that, it's about 40% of people can do their work from home. The 60% of people, including many of your, um, your teams and yours as well, Curtis, in your branches, they are, uh, they are, um, you know, they are on the job. Um, and, and so how we, uh, how we're actually supporting um, in, in this remote though, where people are working remote, it, it, I think we've been, just as we've been able to pivot with our customer, serving customers moving online, most organizations have done a really good job of being able to move into that, um, that online availability of services. Maybe if I could just pick up on that, not easy times for sure for leaders. Uh, these things take a lot of planning and a lot of uh, decision making. Um, and uh, I'm just going to the, the questions. Um, one is uh, from the chat. The panelists are all very inspirational leaders. Other leaders who want to follow your lead will need to be aware of the kind of obstacles that you faced uh, as you implemented progressive programs. Any advice, Curtis or Anthony? Any obstacles that you faced in implementing programs for workplace wellness? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I don't, when we were um, putting some of our programs in place, I, I didn't see any obstacles. I, I think that as long as it's driven from your values and why you're doing it, like being really clear uh, around why you're investing in, uh, in, in mental health, as an example, uh, is, is important. It's just, and, and you know, I like to, you know, just say that, again, we talk about, um, health and health and safety is something that every organization has, right? You, you, you measure it, you monitor it, and but yet, you know, if you don't talk about the mental health side of it, you're you're missing half the equation. So, I think it's just having the conversation, and um, and I, so I, I really didn't see any barriers when we were putting it in place. I think we've been pretty progressive to begin with, but it starts with culture and caring, and mm -hmm. this is another part of caring. It's uh, it's part of you know your DNA. Uh, and you know, mental health does have a spotlight and has had one for a number of years now. Um, and, it's, and COVID made it even more acute. Um, and you can, but as soon as you can have those conversations, um, I think whatever barriers there are disappear pretty quickly. I, I, I think, I, but I was very fortunate. So. I'm glad you underscored culture because it's not just about implementing programs. It's about no. creating that culture, uh, yes. culture and programs together uh, that I think are the recipe for success. Curtis, Absolutely. any comments on that? Challenges or obstacles that you're yeah, well, face? well, again, we would agree. Like, I think we're in vehement agreement here. And 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 I, um, you know, I would just say the biggest obstacle, again, just back to your, it starts at the top. The biggest obstacle will be the leaders, like uh, bar none. Because I, you know, I think once the leaders can really connect and understand the importance of mental wellness in the workplace, there is there is a massive groundswell and a relief in the organization, in fact, that leaders finally recognize it. They're open to have conversations about it. Might not always be skilled. And then, and then the, there's a great deal of support for programs and, uh, you know, some obstacles with contracts and things like that, obviously, that, you know, you're trying to put new, new tools in place and, and such not, but nothing that can't be overcome. Truly, the biggest obstacle is, would be leaders, uh, you know, getting out of their own way to make sure that uh, they fully <laughs> understand and can get behind uh, you know, this very important topic, so. Great, thank you for that. Another question in the chat, uh, uh, how often are employees being consulted, i.e. through surveys, polls, focus groups, for feedback on the programs and policies in place? Uh, are they involved to some degree in supporting positive change? Either Anthony or Curtis, maybe just one of you answer. Yeah, like, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, for us, um, again, we have this culture where, you know, we're high care, high learn, high purpose, and then uh, uh, driven to perform, you know, we have these four unique characteristics of our culture. Um, and, um, um, you know, I, I think, I, I think for me, again, culture is just so important and critical here within this context of, of, how, of how this goes. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a big fan of it. I, I've sort of missed, sort of lost track of the actual question. I was going to go down the road of culture, but what was the specific? Just uh, obstacles that you, obstacles or challenges you may have faced in implementing uh, workplace mental health or mental wellness programs. 
Yeah, and again, I, it's 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 people, it's leaders, it's others. So yeah. Okay, great. And um, Zabine, a slightly different question: uh, Do you uh, or can you identify? Um, areas where more research and knowledge generation are needed on this topic? You know, I'm inclined to say that we have enough data. We, we know um, what the issues are. Uh, perhaps where the research can be helpful is on some of the solutions. So we can continue to better target our, our actions and, uh, and, and our solutions that we can um, get better at identifying or looking for early um, identifiers of um, where there may be issues and being very mindful, obviously, of the privacy aspects of, of, of individuals. But, you know, one thing we haven't touched on is work, uh, work loads and, and hours of work. I mean, there is ample evidence that people are working insane hours. This is not sustainable. This affects our physical and mental health. And uh, so data that, that might uh, really trigger and, and show you where, hey, you know, we're seeing a spike in hours of work in this particular area. Sometimes you can measure it, sometimes you can't. Um, obviously for a lot of white collar workers, it's, it's, it's not something you can do, but, and can you then get proactive and and um, and really look to see what you might be able to do to support people? So for me, it's more the data, not on should we do it, but how can we effectively target that? Um, if if I could just add something to the culture conversation, though, um, that um, that I think is important, and and that is, you know, we talk about employees uh, wanting flexibility. Uh, and often we talk about flexibility in the context of where they can work. Keep keeping in mind, um, there are a lot of people who can't, um, don't have a choice of where they work. Uh, and also when employees are in the office, what they're also looking for is autonomy. They're looking for more control in their day-to-day -day work. They absolutely, we need to be clear on objectives, on outcomes. What is it that, that employees need to deliver? But then we need to let it, let them go and figure out how they're going to do it, and in many cases, what hours they're going to work. And again, I know you know you have to work with customer uh, delivering what your customers require, but we have a lot more flexibility to provide them with that autonomy. And there's ample research that shows that one of the the key pillars of of um, reducing stress or, or one of the key drivers of stress is lack of control. Uh, and, and so there's a whole opportunity here to, um, to, to do that and, and also to move from this hierarchy of level to hierarchy of knowledge so mm. that we are cutting out a lot of the unnecessary layers and layers of approval that also uh, take away some of that autonomy and control. And we did that during the pandemic. We had to because speed was more important than perfection how do we bring those forward into the new world? And I'll end it by saying, I see this as the greatest opportunity in our lifetimes for leaders to create a workplace that's better for all, that's a win-win for employees and for organizations. And so as an optimist, that's the way I look at the opportunity. Yeah, I, I, want to come, like I, I completely agree with that. And, and I think through the, through the pandemic, t, you know, team members at ATB have, have lost control a lot. I mean, th this is some of the polarization of even vaccinations, and mask wearing and some of the requirements that we have. Many team members would feel like they've lost control, not only of with their work life, but their personal life as well. And I want to come back because I remember the, the I apologize, but I, I got I got lost on talking about culture. Was, the question was pointed around feedback from employees, right? And how often do you get feedback? And yes. you know, we we would we would we would we got some feedback that we were over over asking for feedback. To be honest with you, we oh. were running so many different sentiment surveys. Uh, Better that way than the other way. Yeah, but, but exactly. So that that's what we thought. So again, we do tremendous sentiment surveys, and I think I, I think the end is that team members uh, want to see action. Right? You know, they ask us our opinion for sure. However, don't make that an empty ask. Make sure that you follow up with action and. Uh, 
and so therefore their 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 feedback will be valued and uh and or perceived as valued when you take action from that feedback so sentiment surveys we've been you know i've seen it early on we were every four to six weeks asking team members all sorts of different things uh right about uh, including their mental uh, mental health thank you uh, i'm going to ask our ceos to answer the next question just in one sentence what is different about you as a leader today compared to pre-COVID? What is different about you as a leader today compared to pre-COVID? Wow, one sentence, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Can't make it easy for you all the time. <laughs> I would say um, probably a lot more uh, open and flexible to the unknowns because you don't know what those are, but yeah, definitely, definitely more open and flexible. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Curtis. Yeah. Empathetic, open, flexible, and attuned to the many factors in team members' lives that, 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 that sort of impedes their ability to focus on what they really want to do. It was interesting. I think in both of my one-on-one uh, -on -one chats with, uh, with, with you both in the last couple of weeks, um, you both commented in some way about, um, it's not just the person coming to work anymore. It's the family and their environment and everything else in their life that is coming to work with them, um, which I, I thought was a, an interesting, you know, observation. And obviously, you know, it's, that's guiding your thinking too as you, uh, you know, increase uh, your supports for employees. Uh, what would be uh, your best advice for employees and leaders who perhaps um, have very, currently have very limited uh, mental wellness uh, support programs or initiatives in the workplace. Sometimes it can be daunting to launch in, but I think it's really important, especially with the spotlight on this, this issue, that even small businesses who perhaps don't have the same kind of resources as large companies. Uh, Anthony, you're not a small business anymore, but you started as a, a small business uh, decades ago. Uh, any advice for those employers that know that they need to do this, but they really haven't jumped in yet? Yeah, Anybody so can, uh, yeah, I, I I'd say you know kind of um, start with start with a plan, and uh, the CEO needs to be the sponsor. So what you know what problem are you trying to solve? Um, and depending on your culture, how quickly you know you move. But there are you know incredible resources out there that are that are free. I mean, you, there's so there's not you know you don't have to go out there and spend a whole bunch of money. It's it it's you you have to put your time in to research what works for you and your organization. Um, and I'd say, you know, starting with, if you, I'm assuming people would have a benefits provider, for example, their benefits provider could help them with, you know, who to speak to. And, um, you know, EAP is pretty, is a pretty inexpensive benefit, um, and a very powerful one for people. So I'd say, if you're going to spend some money, um, you know, talk, talk to the benefits providers and, and understand, um, you know, what's available there, but there's also so many resources, uh, that are free in the, in the marketplace today. Uh, they're public, you know, just public reports, things like that, um, that, that you can use. So, yeah, so I, I'd say just get started and, but it has to start with the CEO. Um, right. He's got to be the sponsor. Uh, he or she has to be the sponsor of, um, you know, of the initiative for sure. That's, that's, that's critical. Yeah. Wonderful. Great advice. Curtis? Much along that, I, ju I just build on a little bit. I, I think, you know, building on the feedback, I'd ask your team. You know, because we see this, and uh, in fact, I'm part of a small group that is, uh, you know, passionate CEOs across industries looking at potentially creating a B2B here where, you know, is there a package, is there a program that, you know, we can create um, and introduce to small businesses that uh, don't have the resources, don't, might, not, might not have the capacity in the company to, but are keen to get at this. So I, I think there's a model there for sure. But I, I, you know, I would engage your team members. Te team members in small companies are super entrepreneurial, much like the entrepreneurs that lead them, and uh, and they can get really creative. And uh, so I would I, I would start there. But again, start from the top. Got to be motivated top down. Great, wonderful. Thanks, um, Zabine. Did you want to take that one on? Well, at just all? to you know, a change uh, changing culture doesn't cost anything. 
Um, and in terms of what we've talked about are an empathy, compassion, supportive, uh, that's a place that everyone can start. And then being a navigator to, to, what's, um, to what's available out there. Um, I would say one final thing on the question, uh, you know, you, you had a great question around what have you changed in terms of your leadership behavior? And uh, um, what I would add to that is leadership is not just a title. Leadership is about your actions, it's about your behaviors, and we all have a sphere of influence um, and, uh, and, and get to that in, in different ways. So I encourage people, because I know many people in the audience as well might be thinking, you know, I don't have, I, I'm not a leader with a big title, what can I do? Uh, but certainly there's um, this, we, we, are a, a, we are just flatter organization, flatter world. And uh, social media is also a great platform to share your ideas. I'm a frequent uh, poster on, on, on LinkedIn. I mean, I, of course, I had a, a long time leadership, uh, leadership uh, career, but now in this, um, you know, as Zabine Hirji, I can still have um, influence and, and impact through what I do, what I say, and how I connect with people. Uh, and for me, this is about turning this moment, um, this momentum into a movement where this becomes the fabric of our society, of our organizations, and we all have the power to contribute to making that change. We come full circle to walking the talk. That's where we started and we sort of ended there. Um, so we're out of time. I have one final question uh, for our two CEOs. Uh, but just before asking it, I just want to acknowledge that we run a lot of sessions and there aren't usually a lot of questions in the chat. There are a lot of questions in the chat. This is going to stay open for the till 1230 because we have a session after it. So uh, if any of you have a moment to read those questions when we close in a moment and, and put in answers, that'd be great. If you don't know problem at all either, but just wanted to offer that up. Uh, I guess my last question to Anthony and Curtis um, is what are you most proud of when it comes to workplace wellness or workplace mental health? What are you most proud of? Uh, I, I could start. Um, I, I say I, I'm proud that we've made wellness, both physical and, uh, and psychological, um, a big part of our conversation here at Longos. And, you know, I really think that, you know, what I'd, what I'd love to see is that we could, we could talk about, you know, mental health the same way we talk about a, bro a broken arm. I mean, that's how, that's how, you know, fluid it should be, that we should just have the conversations about anxiety or stress and, and various things that people uh, feel from time to time. And uh, like, to me, that would be, you know, we've reached, you know, we've reached the pinnacle of, uh, of making sure that it's, it's part of our day-to-day, -day, um, you know, conversation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud that, you know, the work that we started, you know, many years ago on health and, and wellness and health and safety, we've got some of the best um, health and wellness, health and safety scores in, in WSAB in our, in our industry. So uh, we weren't there, you know, 10 years ago, but today we are, we're, you know, one of the lowest in, in our industry. Um, and we've also introduced, uh, you know, a whole robust set of tools uh, for our team members across uh, across the entire company. So, uh, so I'm really proud of the work that we've that we've done. But it, it does take time, and you do have to change the conversation. And, and so that's so you just got to be patient and persevere, and know that you're making a difference in someone's life um, every day, every time they have a conversation with you or with your EAP people or with your managers. Um, so, so I'm really proud of the fact that we've kind of come a long way in the last uh, 10 or so years. Those scores are particularly impressive considering your team members have largely been front and center through a pandemic in yes. grocery stores where everybody has yeah. been as an essential service. So congratulations on that. Uh, Curtis, uh, the last word goes over to you. What are you most proud of when it comes to workplace wellness and workplace mental health? Yeah, well, I think much like Anthony, like I'm proud of the whole team. We, you know, we, we, the fact that we have mental wellness as a, as one of our four quadrants, you know, it's physical, it's mental, it's spiritual or mindfulness, and then financial wellness as well. Uh, and the fact that we've made it in an important quadrant and disproportionately, we talk about uh, mental health uh, uh, more, more, more times than not uh, out of, out of the four quadrants, especially over the past couple of years. So very proud of the team. And proud of the whole organization who, again, as I mentioned, when, when th this three and a half years ago, when I became the CEO and introduced this notion and passion around, A, not only our wellness team picked up on it because they had already been doing a lot of work behind it, but I gave it a voice, I gave it a platform, I gave it support. And there was, a, I, I tell you what, in my first six months as a leader, as the CEO, this is what team members wanted to talk about. 
like I was talking about the vision of the company and how we're going to be a sustainable, long-term, you know, prosperous organization in this ever-evolving financial services industry. Team members came back, talked to me about mental wellness, talked to me about mental health. What do you do? Like, like just, it was just remarkable. And so the groundswell of AT beers and our culture just never ceases to amaze me. And I'm, I'm so proud of what we've been able to do so far. And we, when we recognize we have a journey ahead of us, you know, that we, that we're vulnerable enough to say we we've taken some big steps and boy, we can do so much more. And, and in the context, not only for us as an organization, but more broadly, how do we underneath our greater good platform, enhance the well being of Albertans, the four and a half million Albertans. That's when you really begin to get goosebumps uh, and excited about what, uh, what we can do as an organization. We're ready for it. Well, um, I want to thank you on behalf of Mental Health Research Canada, all three of you for taking time out of what I know are very busy schedules to talk about this today. Uh, you're just fantastic role models for other leaders and thank you for being authentic and real and being able to open up on a personal level. This is not an easy topic. There are no easy answers uh, and we're all doing the best that we can. And uh, congratulations uh, to you and your organizations and your teams uh, for making this such a priority. Uh, and we're, we're very excited to have heard from you today. And Zabine, clearly you have a wealth of knowledge uh, on this topic. And I'm gonna follow up with you on some, any potential research gaps because at Mental Health Research Canada, we may be interested in working with you on some things. Um, thank you again to Curtis and awesome. Anthony, uh, a big virtual round of applause. And uh, it's been a distinct pleasure and uh, congratulations again. And good luck as you lead forward with this uh, as a strong focal point uh, in your vision for a great place to work. So. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Take care. Thanks, Bye now. Anthony. Thanks, Sabine. Bye-bye. Bye, Sabine. Bye. Meet you. Take care. So it's now my pleasure uh, after that uh, wonderful conversation. And I was delighted that there were so many questions in the chat. Uh, we're going to um, see if we can um, recoup those and address some of them in future sessions. But uh, I'd, I'd now like to turn over to Marianne Baton. Uh, Marianne, um, as many of you know, is a Director of Collaboration and Strategy at Workplace Strategies for Mental Health. Uh, she's going to lead a bit of a, a discussion around what we heard today. And then she's also going to do uh, a bit of a presentation around um, workplace uh, wellness resources that currently exist. So Mary Ann, I'm going to turn over to you and I'm going to go off camera and uh, thank you again for contributing to this important event with all of the knowledge that you bring to the table. Thanks, Akila. I was fascinated listening to these leaders um, and most fascinated, I think, by their authenticity about what they're going through. Sorry about that. And, and how difficult this is, that there is no cookie cutter approach, there are no easy answers, but that if we keep focused on what the end goal is, that we can get there. So what Akila has asked me to do is share, based on what these leaders said, some of the resources that exist that are free for anybody to use so that if you have a limited amount of resources to invest in this, that there's ways that you can do it without a separate budget line. And that's really what I'm going to do. So I'm just gonna go through each of the leaders, share what I picked up from them, and then share some of the things that are available on the Workplace Strategies for Mental Health website that you can use. So the, some of the things that Sabine had brought forward is that we needed to make leadership more caring and human. And my feeling is um, that that's not the way many leaders were taught to lead. They were taught the command and control model. They were taught to never let them see you sweat. They were taught to be able to um, motivate and push people. And the thing is, that that is not the most effective way to maximize the energy and the potential of people. So rather than catch leaders doing it wrong and, uh, and either disciplining them or shaming them, uh, the psychologically safe leader assessment is meant to support leader development in um, a supportive way to say, here are, and I think there's about 60 leadership strategies that are known 
to support psychological health and safety in the workplace. Rate yourself on where you think you are with these right now. And just the act of doing it actually presents to the leaders more ways that they can improve psychological health and safety for the team. The other part of this resource is that you can then ask leaders um, to send it to their employees so that you can see if the employee assessment of the leader differs. Now, let me tell you that if it does differ, it doesn't mean that the leader is delusional. Um, it doesn't mean that they overrated themselves. What it can mean is that employees don't know what a leader would do behind closed doors. They don't know that they could reach out to them when they're struggling and that they would refer them to resources or help them because the conversations never happened. So there's a whole suite of ideas just in this one resource to help leaders learn what psychologically safe leadership is, to engage their employees in a dialogue about it, and to improve. Sabine also said that we have to protect the well being of senior leaders and managers. And that's certainly been my experience in working with employers across the country is that first of all, leaders now have a much clearer idea, and many of the uh, CEOs today talked about that, of the need for empathy, of the impact of mental well being or the lack of it on employees. We have done a lot of work around how to prevent burnout for yourself, but also as a leader, how to prevent burnout for others. And to look at, we have an organizational assessment, so a series of questions that organizations can ask about whether they are contributing to or protecting against burnout. We have an assessment for you to do, to say, how close am I? in approaching burnout? What risks am I at? It's not a medical diagnosis, but it certainly can help you become more aware. And as somebody who has burned out, um, the best advice I can give you is it sucks and don't go there. And so the more you learn about it before you do, the better it is. And we have a whole series of healthy break activities, things that can calm your mind, things that can relax your body if the work is physically exhausting or things that can energize you. And those healthy break activities can be good for senior leaders, um, managers, and employees. Now, she, Sabine also talked about workload management. And here's the thing about that. I bet all of you on the call today can think of a time when you were really energized, you're excited about the work you were doing, you couldn't wait to get to work, the day went really fast, you were still thinking about it when you went home because you had ideas about it. It wasn't the amount of work that usually stresses us out. It is the way we're made to think about the work. It is when you feel like it's never going to be good enough that there's gonna be negative repercussions if you don't get it done, that um, you're not valued for what you do. And we have a workshop, it's called, um, it's part of our On the Agenda series and I'm gonna to talk to you more about it, but it's about workload management and it is how to bring your teams together to talk about what are the stressors related to work. Because in any workplace, if you don't have more work than hours in the day, it means people are sitting around. That's not um, productive. That is not efficient. But if we have so much work and we feel we're never going to get it caught up, that can be really damaging to our mental health. So how do we get the sweet spot where there's more work than can be done in a day, but that we can feel good about prioritizing and doing the things we want. This workshop, which you can facilitate. So the slides are there for you to download, the facilitator's guide with even all the speaking notes that you can modify for yourself and the handout, all of it's there for you. But these, this workshop brings the team together to say, what can we do and how can we do it differently? 
And Sabine also talked about hybrid work teams and there's information there, work from home, which is for the individual to maximize their potential, their energy when they're working from home. And then our work on hybrid teams, which is how to have that balance between the people who are working at home, who may feel the people in the workplace are getting um, better treatment and the people in the workplace feeling the people at working from home are not doing their fair share. So as a manager, how do you manage that? All of that is available on the website. Sabine also said, we have enough data on the issues. And I have to agree with her. We know what needs to be done. Now we need to do it. Um, we're doing with Mental Health Research Canada and, and other partners, we're doing research this year on how psychological health and safety is experienced differently by vulnerable populations. And then we'll be going across the country speaking to experts in inclusivity to say, how can we do this better? So the research is certainly going to help us focus in on what needs to be done differently. And she also talked about increasing the autonomy and control of employees. And of course, that happened because of the pandemic. And uh, most um, employees stepped up. They showed that they could work from home. They could work without supervision. They could get things done. And what we find is the trust that we put in employees ends up being um, a benefit in terms of the loyalty that we get from them. The on the agenda workshop series that I've already talked to you about, it, each one of them is based on a psychosocial factor that's named in the standard on psychological health and safety in the workplace. And each one of them is engaging the team members, your own team members, in talking about what does this psychosocial factor mean? How should it show up in our workplace? How can we all contribute to it? So that workshop series you could actually use for years, doing one or two a year and really building on engaging the employees in that process of continual improvement and continual feedback. And now we're looking at what Curtis had to say. And Curtis said that, um, of course, mental illness affects those we love, whether it's people that we care about in the workplace or people we care about at home. And in our um, employee resources section, there is information, whether that person is a family member, it's a friend, it's a coworker, there's a lot of information there. But many of us don't have a lot of time to go and read a whole bunch of information. And so what we've done is we've created these subscriptions. And again, I want to impress upon you everything I'm talking to you about is free. It's in English and French. It's online. Um, there's no strings attached. These are created for the greater good of all. So the mental health awareness subscription, if you're a leader, you subscribe to it. You read the little blurb, which is either going to lead it. So it's in and of itself, it's a little tip um, about mental health, about awareness of mental illness, really about learning. So each one's a little tip, but it links to something that maybe is a deeper dive, whether it's a, a short video clip, none of them are going to be more than five minutes, some of them are much less or to a document or to a web page. But if you do it as a leader yourself, you subscribe, you can also add in what you want them to know about it, how you feel about it, and then just send it out to all of your folks. Or you can have them all subscribe themselves and get it direct to their inbox. Um, some people use that as a mental health awareness campaign. So you're taking five minutes of your employees time each week, it costs you nothing. And um, over time, it's a lot of information in bite sized pieces. Um, Curtis also talked about expanding support for mental health for well being beyond the organization to the community. And what we put together for you is a workplace wellness program calendar and in it. 
we've looked across the country at associations and organizations that provide us with free toolkits to promote well-being, whether it's about heart or diabetes, if it's about inclusivity, if it's about racism, if it's about um, National Women's Day, whatever the concept is that in English and French, you can find tools and resources so that your wellness program calendar can be really full, either for your employees or to engage the community at large. And everything that you need is there. We've made sure that the resources are credible, that they're free, that they're useful. Um, Curtis talked about his Fridays where he spends 30 minutes talking about different topics, but often about mental wellness. Now, um, some uh, CEOs like the ones that you heard today are comfortable and articulate and they can carry that. Some don't feel as comfortable. And we've put together team building activities that take 30 minutes or less that really can bring up these topics, bring up engagement of employees in a way that is easy to facilitate. So these team building activities um, range from emotional intelligence, resilience, team cohesion, um, all sorts of different topics. And basically, you choose the ones that resonate with you, you choose the ones that are going to resonate with your team, and you present them. Really simple. And they have Wellness Wednesdays, where they have guests speaking about mental health. And there's so many um, organizations that have speakers that will speak about mental health, that will speak about mental illness. And if you call your local CMHA, your local mood disorders, um, but also there's speakers associations that are specifically individuals who have dealt with their mental health and can tell you how they have managed it. We have what we um, title mental uh, health awareness videos. So if you can't get a guest speaker to come in, that you can play these videos. And in them, we ask people who actually had a mental illness who in the workplace, who recovered from it, to answer questions like, what did it feel like before you knew? So you're at work, you don't know what's going on. What did that feel like? We ask some questions like, what's your advice to family and friends who don't know how to help? What's your advice to leaders who have an employee that's working for them that has a mental illness and they're walking on eggshells because they're not quite sure the right thing to say or do? Each of these videos, of course, are free for download. And what we had done in 2009 when we first did this project is we did it in English and dubbed it in French. What we did in this last time is we um, did it with francophones as well as those that were English speaking. And so the quality for those of you who want both French and English is much better. So Curtis went on to say, be clear about your why in investing in workplace mental health. And we've got many resources to help senior leaders really establish their why. So there's something simple, 20 questions for leaders to think about how this matters, how you might measure it, how it might impact your workplace. This is really a risk assessment questionnaire, the 20 questions for leaders about how not dealing with these issues might impact the workplace. We have organizational culture questions for senior leaders, and these were developed by Deb Connors, who was the person who founded the Health, Work and Wellness Conference, and Dr. Martin Shane, who founded Neighbor at Work. They both contributed questions for senior leaders to ask themselves, where are we now and where do we want to go? Um, they're just on the website for you. And in the Guarding Minds at Work tool, there's a resource that people are not as familiar with. Many of you are familiar with the employee survey. 
where you get a report that's broken down by each statement. You can then turn around and act on each statement because what we give you, the tool itself is just such a small part of Guarding Minds. It's just a series of questions where employees agree or disagree or rate the amount by which they see these things happening. The important part is the next step, which is what are you gonna do about it? And, and how are you gonna engage? But the organization review is where senior leaders sit down, understand the psychosocial factors, understand how it impacts the evaluations and measurements you already do in the workplace, what data can be impacted by each psychosocial factor. And then it asks the leaders to rate where they think it is now and to think about what they could do about it. So even if you never survey your employees, you could do this organizational review and have a clear picture on what you want to do and how you want to do it. As somebody said to me, we have limited time, limited resources. How do we decide where to invest them? This is how. Figure out where um, the best bang for your buck is. Where are you going to make the best difference in the hearts and minds of your employees? Um, the other thing that uh, Curtis said that I just loved is don't ask us your opinion if you aren't going to follow up with action. And we call that concept, don't rush to survey. If you're going to do a survey, already have in your mind some things you're going to do differently before you get the results so that you can show action immediately. And some of that is covered in um, a web page we have called Where Do We Start? with psychological health and safety. And it walks you through some of those mistakes that people could make in jumping to a survey, just asking opinions and never really having a plan of action in advance. And I just wanna say, you know, I was involved with the development of the National Standard of Canada for psychological health and safety in the workplace. I'm going to be involved in its update, which is going to be happening over the next 18 months. But you don't need the entire survey to start making a difference. If you only ask the question, how might this impact the psychological health and safety of our employees? And by this, I mean, this decision, this change, this program, this policy, this interaction, this um, event impact the psychological health and safety of our employees, that alone is going to shift your thinking to be more closely aligned with these leaders who already get it. So we can do this. We don't have to have a huge budget. We don't have to wait until we can put a big initiative into place. And Curtis also talked about that empathy is now a very high factor because of the pandemic. And that I, I've uh, said at different times, I wonder if I manifested the pandemic because I really wished employers um, and leaders could get it. And then the pandemic made that happen. So I do apologize. Um, but we've got lots of resources for that too. Strengthening leadership skills is a resource that self-study for leaders to improve their own emotional intelligence as it relates to managing people. The back to work checklist is really about thinking before you invite employees back to the workplace about the range of emotions that people are going to be feeling and about how you're going to not just protect them from illness, but how you're going to psychologically protect them from the changes, from the fears, the concerns, from the stress of coming back into a workplace after, for some people, almost two years. And the resources on burnout that I talked to you about before are especially important for leaders right now. Everybody from the supervisors on up have been stepping up, trying hard to be all things to all people, trying hard to keep the work going, to covering for people who are stressed out or dealing with family issues. And if we don't protect our leaders, we can't expect them 
to protect our employees. So, and then Anthony and the things that he shared, I loved what he said about being supportive, authentic, uh, firm. The, the thing is, is when he first said, treat people like family, I'm thinking, hey, I know some dysfunctional families. I'm not sure that's what we want. But when he clarified and explained what it meant, then I thought, yeah, OK, I'll be in that family. That's the way that we want to be. Um, so he said that if you have a team who feels valued and cared for, it translates and them caring for each other and for customers, clients, patients, whoever are your stakeholders in your workplace. And that is not just what Anthony says, that is what the evidence says as well. And we look at authenticity, and this is so important. And again, I love how he clarified. That doesn't mean that you're blubbering all the time or that, you know, you just have no professionalism. It means that you're open and you're honest. And I say that vulnerability, authenticity is the new courage. It is, if you can be vulnerable without um, being what Anthony called soft, but what other people would call um, weak or wishy-washy or all over the place. But if you can say, you know what, I'm not focusing today and this is why, that can help your team not take it personally. And so we did a lot of research on building trust, which of course includes authenticity for leaders. And I really encourage you to check out that content because it breaks it down by all of the um, different components that make people feel that you're trustworthy and what it would look like in the workplace. But then it says, have that talk. So if you feel that you haven't done well in one of those components, then what you can do is have an open conversation with your team and say, yeah, I wanna do better in this area. So let's talk about what would that look like? And if you get people to trust you in the workplace, you can make mistakes and they will forgive you. And trust me, we will make mistakes. So it's important to build that trust because once it's broken down, um, it's tougher to build it back up. But if they trust you and they trust that you're vulnerable and they know you're going to make mistakes, they'll forgive you for it. Um, another thing that Anthony said was have a great EAP program. Now, EAP programs are not the entire answer. The way we treat each other in the workplace is as critical as sending somebody to an outside resource, but he's right. Have you ever looked at your EAP program and really understood how it supports or doesn't support both mental health and mental illness? Some EAP programs do not diagnose or treat mental illness. And some that do don't have the range of evidence-based tools that are necessary to really have the impact on every single type of mental illness or addiction. So um, unfortunately, the Employee Assistance Society of North America has just recently um, dissolved. And I guess the pandemic probably was part of that. But before then, they helped us create information that anybody in an organization can take and do a checklist to understand your EAP, what you can negotiate and how you can have the best combination of services to really help your employees from where they're at. And Anthony also talked about those who have student workers or student interns and being able to support them. So we have a, a fabulous resource called Plan for Resilience. And it is really um, a self-reflective exercise for you to think about how resilient you are now and how you might build that resilience. And we know that when you build resilience, you can prevent burnout, you can prevent the worst effects from uh, exposure to traumatic incidents. 
And uh, it really helps you, uh, as somebody said, not bounce back from uh, tragedy or challenges, but bounce forward to be able to have that um, post-traumatic growth that they talk about, that you can learn from and move forward from things that are difficult. So we have that available. Um, I've, before the pandemic, I was doing workshops all across the country on that. But we noticed that students saw this and talked about it differently. And so we created one specifically for post-secondary students. And the interesting thing is, of course, all of our workshop materials are free. You can deliver them yourself. But the way that we set this one up is you can do plan for resilience for your employees, but for the students, you can give them the from surviving to thriving tool, but you can facilitate the whole thing all together at once because the concepts are all the same. Just a really interesting and useful piece. The other thing I'll tell you about that is when we looked at the evidence, we know that that particular resource can reduce distress immediately, and it can also improve that sense of competence that I can do this. Anthony talked about the Not Myself Today campaign from CMHA, and part of that is opening a dialogue, getting people to talk about their emotions. And we have an emotional intelligence self-assessment. So you can see where yours is right now. But the nice thing is, it also gives you resources that if you want to improve in any area, you can. There's um, activities for employees. There's activities for leaders. And then Anthony also said, start with your leaders. Give them the why and give them the resources. And I very strongly agree with this, that if we don't support our leaders to do it differently, if we don't give them the tools, we don't give them the resources and the support, we can't expect them to suddenly become psychologically safe when that's not the way they were trained to begin with. So I'm going to pause there because I would like to open it up um, for questions because um, Akela had said, we got to put workplace wellness front and center, and we have to leverage existing resources. I want to say that all of them are free. That's where you can get them. But Akela, have we got some questions from the audience? Um, yes, we do. Actually, uh, I'm interested in getting involved in workplace wellness and mental health. I work in the recreation and fitness sector. Can you recommend any training or certification programs in workplace wellness? Yeah, so Centennial College um, has a workplace well-being. It's a post-grad program. And uh, the reason I know about it is because we get student interns from there. But these are people who have already done their degree and really are um, stepping forward into uh, that. If you wanted something that was um, more general in terms of uh, well-being, from the measurement health and safety perspective, there's an online program from the University of Fredericton on um, psychological health and safety. So there's lots out there. The other thing is to look at some of the people who are doing it and ask if you can shadow them and get uh, involved that way. Um, I'm gonna ask a question that was posed earlier. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on this. Sorry, it was posed earlier in the chat uh, before you started. Uh, so I'm not sure if you can comment or not. Uh, progressive company policies are critical, but we also hear a lot these days about the rise of insecure employment, less robust pensions and other trends in employment. How do we move forward uh, keeping in mind all these factors? Well, I think, yes, we brought together some of the great minds um, from across the country and we have um, policy recommendations for psychological health and safety. So if you do want to do a policy review with an eye to how it might support that, you can do that. Um, in terms of the uh, precarious employment, I won't speak specifically to it other than to say we absolutely know that if you feel insecure in your employment, you're going to have more stress. But there is also um, something on the website called psychologically or termination and layoffs. So it's, it's really about 
if you know you're going to have precarious employment, you can even do that in a psychologically safer way. Um, I'm just going to pause to see. I know I have a couple of colleagues who've been monitoring the chat through the whole session. So uh, David or Michael, if you'd like to jump in. Um, uh, Marianne, I'm interested if uh, you know of uh, research out there or research gaps. Uh, I've, I've been seeing in the last uh, short while, and there were comments today around uh, leaders and the need to support leaders as human beings. Um, I've also been contacted um, by uh, um, uh, HR leaders that they are feeling an enormous amount of pressure right now. They are the front, front and center of everything that's happening every day in every workplace right now in a way that they never have been before. Um, and I'm wondering if, is there research uh, that you're aware of that's, a, that's addressing the needs of, of the HR uh, team leads or any insights that you have in that space? Because I know they're under enormous pressure. Yeah, they, I mean, the research around the stress on leaders has been around for decades. And the pandemic has only amplified what they're going through. And the research that you did for us recently, and the research that we're working on right now is also showing what is going on. I think that when we look um, in January at how psychological health and safety affects those in leadership, um, we'll be able to manage that. But the thing is, is we ignore them like they're supposed to have it all together. And, and right. the, the truth is they're just human beings that for some reason got put into these positions. Maybe they were really technically astute or maybe they're just nice people. But I can't tell you the number of leaders I've worked with and they call me in to help an employee and they're in worse shape. And so we have to care about the mental health and well-being and, and uh, of leaders. And we have to, the, the research is already there. We know it exists. It's, it's like uh, Sabine said, we don't need more research telling us their stress. What we need is research telling us how do you support leaders to be psychologically safe for themselves and for others. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm just going to, oh, I see a, a question hand that's been put up there. I think that might be my colleague, David. Uh, yes, hi. There's a question in the chat about uh, research on vulnerable populations and building psychological safety. And the, uh, the question is, uh, Marianne, if you can offer any additional insight on that particular subject. Uh, just that it'll be January when the results of the survey come out about that. And then starting in February, um, COVID allowing, I'm going to be bringing people that their specialty is inclusion in workplaces, I'm gonna be bringing them together at round tables across the country. And by the end of the year, I really hope that we're gonna have a solution. That's the whole point of that, is if, if you're somebody um, from a certain culture, if you're someone in the LGBTQ community, if you are somebody with a disability, we wanna know what the experience is like. And then we wanna know how we can help employers and many of them want to make a difference. They're just not sure how. How can we help employers make that better? It's yeah. wonderful. Uh, thank you, Marianne. And we are at 1227, bang on time. Um, I just want to thank you. First of all, uh, I, I want to compliment you. I'm not quite sure how you pulled all of that information together. Uh, I know you did not speak to uh, our panelists today in advance. So everything that you just presented, you pulled together as they were speaking. So clearly you can assimilate a lot of information quickly. And I think that was an outstanding summary. Um, it's absolutely a pleasure working with you. This is such important work and you have so much deep knowledge and expertise and Mental Health Research Canada, I know is working very closely with your organization on a number of important research related projects uh, over the next few months. And we look forward to sharing the results of uh, some of that work in social media collectively together. So uh, on behalf of our team and on behalf of the audience, thank you for your enthusiastic um, uh, participation today and in particular for assimilating all of that uh, information in a way that was just a perfect follow-up uh, to that discussion with our leaders. So we look forward to our, our next activities together. And uh, thank you so much. I'm seeing so many positive comments in the chat all through today's session. Uh, so thank you again. And I look forward uh, to next time. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks all.